Broadcasting live from Syracuse, New York, it's the BS and Ed Show. Addressing topics of public safety, education, and much more. Please welcome your hosts, Matt Mallory and Pat Kimball. Hello everybody, this is the PS and Ed Show with Matt and Pat. Good to see you, Pat. Good to see you, brother. How are you? Awesome. Nice. So today we're going to talk about one of your most favorite topics. I know. The AR-15. Yeah. Yeah. And though a lot of people out there hear AR and they think big black scary gun and it stands for assault rifle or, or uh, automatic rifle, or though we love America, it does not stand for American rifle. It will. <laughs> um, it stands for Armalite Rifle, the company that invented it back in the 1950s with the help of Eugene Stoner. Uh, it was a civilian rifle before it became a military rifle and, and uh, turned into the M16, A1, A2, A3, A4, and now the M4. That's right. You make a lot of great points, and one of the things people don't realize is that even though it was developed for use by the military, yep. they were having a lot of problems developing and fielding it, and when before it was actually fielded by the military, they started fielding it, Colt did, as a civilian gun, right? Yep. And uh, it was very popular in the beginning because it was lightweight, and it was semi-automatic, and it was fun to shoot, and it shot a hot new little cartridge, and so it was a right. really cool gun. And since, it's obviously become our most popular semi-automatic rifle here in America, right? So, and pretty it's, cool. It's pretty cool how they, uh, it was a really a collaboration when the military came, uh, wanted a, a, somebody to make something like this. Colt, with Eugene Stoner, Remington coming out with the 223, and that collaboration coming together to be able to put, put this into the market. Right. And being that it came out back in the 50s, you know, a lot of people think, oh, this gun's, you know, it's terrible. It's, it's used in all these different active killer events. Well, yeah, but it's not the gun, right? It's what right. people are doing. And we don't need to get off on that because we've talked about that before. You know, just because it's the most used doesn't mean that that's the problem. Right. So it's the same concept. Just because this is the most used, it's been around since the 50s. It's, you know, it's, a, it's tried, true, and tested. It's the American rifle that we really need to focus on the, the bad guys and what they're doing and not and what they're using. Well, if this wasn't one of the best tools out there, then there'd be another best tool out yeah. there, right? Yeah. So there's always Stones. gonna be some other, yes, yeah, so there's always gonna be some other thing that can take that, that mantle yeah. up if we, you know, got rid of all the, getting rid of all the ARs doesn't really solve the human element of that well, problem. And to think about that too, if people think automatic rifle or um, assault rifle, let's talk about automatic rifle, not fully semi-automatic, not, you know, that mindset. When we talk about the, the M16A1, right. that was a full auto. Yes. Uh, M16A2, which is what I used when yeah. I was in, was three round burst. Yep. And then the M16A3, it came back out with full auto. It did, yeah. And then what you used was the M16A4 and the M4, right. which was three round burst. Both were three round burst. And yep. then you have the M4A1 that's also full automatic. Mm -hmm. And actually a lot of military units are going to start to see M4A1s coming back. Yep. Uh, because the military has decided that it's a good idea to yeah. give troops that suppressive fire capability in their individual weapons. Because that's what automatic fire really is when we use Right, it's more about just putting a lot of bullets down. Shock around. and awe, shock right. and awe. We just need a lot of hate going in yep. that direction. Yep. Definitely. Yep. So that's how we do, right? So let's talk about some of the differences in all of these guns. Uh, they all run off the direct gas impingement yep. system, as we know, right? Um, yes. So a lot of people think that it because it's very dirty, that it's not necessarily a reliable system. Yeah, and a lot of people will compare it to, you know, like an AK. You can drop the AK in the mud, pull the AK out, you know, 762 by 39 and, mm -hmm. and, and shoot it. And that is a very, uh, you can get that gun really dirty and, and still use it and it'll still shoot effectively. If you look at a Volvo or a, a Rolls Royce or Mercedes Benz, right. you know, they're more expensive guns or higher quality. Um, you're going to have more minute things that have to run perfectly for that gun to run in top performance. That's the concept of this. It's a high quality gun. It's got to run in top performance, high, uh, low tolerance as far as uh, difference in parts and stuff. Well, the AK, right, is a conscript rifle. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's used by conscript armies and it was developed by the Soviet Union yeah. to be given to people who were forced into service, right? right? And they were made to be mass produced and very, very cheaply, right? Yep. And now they're in the hands of every child soldier everywhere, right? Unfortunately. Right, which I'm, I'm not, I shouldn't make light of that. But what I'm saying is that these are professional grade pieces of equipment, right? right? A lot of engineering over many years. We just talked about multiple revisions over many years right. that have happened with them. There, yeah, there has been a lot more that's changed about this design over time than the AK. Definitely. And also, we've seen. Um, 
we've seen so many improvements and so many modularity upgrades yeah. to different types of this gun. Right. I mean, and so look at the key mod, you know, the, the difference in types of, of grips and everything. I mean, all the mine were all plastic, you know, the round, old round plastic oh, ones. Oh, you had the round ones? Yeah. Oh, because the, A, the A1 had the triangle ones. Mm -hmm. I mean, remember yeah. those? Yeah. Those look really cool, and they're, right. they're super lightweight, but they heat up. I don't yeah. know if you ever had mm -hmm. used one, but high volume shooting, they get hot. They get real warm. No, I had three rumbers. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I remember. Dude, that was fun. Three gun versus good. So, um, speaking of of making sure that you know it's a well machined gun, something like this, I had mentioned to you the, the issues that I, that I was having with this gun. Right. I ended up not having enough uh, space, so it wouldn't shut all the way. Yep. So then, having to go back in and re ream it out some, now it's got it's loose. Right. And because it's loose, it doesn't cycle. Right. So yeah, you you have this block here at the top of your upper receiver, and if that block isn't held securely in place, then you're gonna get that play between wow. the upper and the lower, right? When you get that play, your buffer isn't gonna track correctly from the tube, uh, excuse me, your bulk carrier group won't track correctly into the tube and actually yep. cycle the gun. So you're gonna have a one lot shot. of issues, yeah. It was one shot, and, and to actually get it to shoot, you'd have to hold it on the side of the upper, and it's, that's not realistic. Yeah, that's not a good look, so we're gonna need to do something about that. Um, let's talk about the differences in some of these guns. So here we got a mid-length gas system. Here we have a mid-length gas system. Actually, all of these guns had mid-length gas yep. systems. Now, a carbine-length gas system would have uh, the gas block positioned right here. I'll try and get it closer to the camera where you can actually see. My finger is pointing to the gas block inside that handguard right now. The, hand, the gas block would be a little farther back on a carbine length. And what that does, right, is it allows the gas to travel more quickly through the system because the tube is shorter, yep. right? So the gas has less time to expand and travel. It's also because it has uh, because it has a shorter tube, it's actually expanding much more violently. So mm -hmm. your gun is gonna cycle a lot more violently with a carbine like gas system, right. right? So what they did was they they realized that the carbine like system was chewing chewing up guns and chewing up uh, bulk hair groups, yep. things like that. So they went to a mid-length gas system, which is what we enjoy today. For me, I prefer the mid-length gas system because I feel like it's a smoother cycling gun. I feel like it's more of a soft shooting gun. And um, I feel like the gas pressure at the port and in the tube is that much lower, so everything is gonna last that much longer. So let's talk about ways that we can mitigate some of the differences yeah. in our gas systems, right? Uh, one of the things that people don't understand when they're building these guns is that gas ports are going to be different sizes depending on the manufacturer of right. your block and of your barrel, right? Yeah, it all match. You want it to be compatible at yep. the very least because yep. we don't want to be creating too much port pressure because we have too uh, small of a port on the on the rifle and too large of a port on the uh, gas block itself. Right. That could cause problems. Um, we also want to make sure that our gas blocks are appropriately attached to our barrels. Mm -hmm. I usually recommend dimpling your barrel if you're going to put on a gas block yourself or at least using knurled head set screws on your gas block or so that at least your screws can't back themselves you know, yeah. out. And uh, you're gonna be that much more reliable because the gas system has to be tight. Right? Yeah. Everything has and to be in like perfect a, alignment. A hole in your tire, right? I mean, it, that's the concept. You have to have a sealed system. It has to be a completely, exactly. It has to be a sealed system in that way. So carbine like gas is gonna be a more reliable gun in a lot of people's mindsets because you are getting more gas into the port and you are getting a more violently cycling gun. Yep. So the theory there is that the gun can be a little bit more dirty and the uh, dirtiness isn't gonna slow it down to yep. the same degree that it would with a, a mid-length gas system where the port pressure is gonna be a little bit lower and everything's gonna be cycling a little bit more slowly and not quite so violently. You can mitigate that too. And you can mitigate that by changing out your buffer spring or your the weight of your buffer. Right? Because if we have a heavier buffer, what that's going to do is it's going to still move very uh, vigorously with a lot of force, no, but not as fast. It's eating up some of that inertia by a heavier buffer. Exactly. So we're actually taking some of that reciprocal mass and we're, we're adding more reciprocal mass, but we're actually putting it behind the bolt carrier group. So it's slowing that bolt carrier group down right. as it's traveling to the rear. So that's going to help keep your sights on the target mm -hmm. and that's going to help keep you... Uh, you know, able to deliver better follow-up shots nice. and all those sorts of things. There's also rifle length gas. Uh, usually we see that on 18, 20 longer barrels. Right. 
longer ones. And, and, and we both are the firm believer that we use our handgun to fight to get to our long gun. Hundred percent. Yeah. So the the long gun is the effective tool, even even if it's a shotgun. It's better than a handgun in that sense. You're going to bring down more, you know, more lead, more rain on somebody with a shotgun or, or with a rifle in a case like that. You're going to reach out further, you know, more uh, accurate shots with a with a rifle or a long gun, we should say. I always look at it from the perspective of a handgun is an emergency use tool, right? It's on a body, defensive ready, tool, ready. right? I have it with me all the time. That's why it's effective. Right. My rifle can be a game changer because that's an actual gun fighting. That's a winning tool. Right, that's yeah. to actually be able to close distance, locate, destroy, close with and destroy your enemy. That's what the rifle is for. Yeah. So the differentiation between the handgun and the rifle, guys, is the handgun might save your life, the rifle will help you win. Win the fight. Right, exactly. Yeah, so that's why I'm so passionate about the rifle. Yeah, most definitely. So let's talk about that as far as a lot of people try to be thrifty mm -hmm. and, and you know spend the least amount. Of, I, I'm notorious for it too, trying to spend the least amount on something as possible. Sure. So that being said, um, what failure points in a AR uh, happen because somebody's thrifty, and what should you stay away from? So basically, quality of rifle and the do's and the don'ts as far as what to be cheap on and what not to be cheap on when you're when you're looking for an AR. Okay, great. Well, the barrel to me is is the biggest component, right? Because not only is that going to determine how accurate your gun can be potentially, right. but it's also going to determine for what period of time. Because if you don't have a barrel that's manufactured for proper materials, then it's not going to last. Right. Falling apart. So for me, like a lot of people like 416 stainless steel mm -hmm. on their M4 barrels. I think 416 stainless is fine, but understand it's a very, very hard steel. Mm -hmm. And as you're shooting it, the bullets are going to wear that that barrel out a lot more quickly. So you might have more accuracy in the beginning, right? Right. But for me, I like a 4150 Chrome Molly V barrel. Yep. That's what I have here on my gun. This is my uh, United Armory Cold Hammer Forged barrel. This is a very good barrel for the money. I only spent about a hundred bucks on it. Now I like it because it's dimpled where the gas block is. Right. So I know that those set screws are not it's going right. anywhere. Right. right? I like the weight and the contour of the barrel. This is like a SOCOM contour style barrel. Mm -hmm. So it's got some meat to it in the right places, right. but it's also got a slim contour out here toward the end. So it really allows me to drive the gun because I don't have a whole bunch of weight out here. Nice. So to me, um, the barrel is everything. That's the starting point. And then from there, we go to the bolt carrier group. Yep. And we need to have a great bolt carrier group because that's where all the action happens. This is the most important. This is taking all of the the reciprocation, reciprocating yeah. force, and uh, obviously Fire your pin. bolt face, yeah, yeah is Fire locked into in your chamber, right? Yeah. So your extractor, all that stuff's right in there. Yeah, this is this is the heart of the gun, really. Right. This is the the engine that kind of drives the whole thing. It's a bolt carrier group. If somebody hears BCG, then that's the the short term the acronym, acronym right. for bolt carrier group. Right. So then moving back from there, we start to talk about our buffer tube. Yep. We need a strong buffer tube, okay? Because again, this is where the reciprocation yeah, happens. It's the it's like, brunt of the uh, the recoil. Right. My bolt carrier group has to make it into this buffer tube. If this buffer tube gets crushed, guess what? Nothing is happening. Right. I, have a, I have a really expensive single that. shot at that <laughs> exactly. point, right? So that's not a good thing. So we need a good buffer tube and we need a good buffer because those things are going to keep everything moving, right? There's a company, um, I see it, the, see them at the shows all the time, the Law Tactical maybe? Yeah, they make the fold. Yeah, the fold up. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I think, I think there's a lot of neat systems out there uh, like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think the Law is probably the best one. It's also very, very expensive. Yes. But if you have the money... Yeah. Uh, and you're willing to spend it, I think that that's a great uh, investment because if I had that, I could just fold this up and I could shove this right into a backpack and uh, nobody would be the wiser. Definitely. So that's uh, that's my two cents on what actually makes the okay. gun so, work. So we said rifle, BCG, and buffer tube. Yep, the barrel, BCG, and buffer tube are probably going to be your most important components as far as having a reliable system that's going to going to work when you need it to, right? Now let's talk about some of the, the points that we want to modify, points yeah, of modification, definitely. right? So sights. This gun has no sights. That's exactly. how most guns come nowadays. Yep. When you go and buy an AR-15, the majority of them are going to come without sights. Yep. So we need to have some sort of sights. However, probably a good idea to make sure your sights are right. facing forward as opposed <laughs> to facing rearward. This front sight that on one of our customers' guns is actually facing in the wrong direction. Not the end of the world, right? But 
it was funny to me when I saw it. I said, man, that's a backward sight we got. But they bring them to us. Yeah, exactly, right? So another sighting system we could use if we didn't like our Magpul tactical uh, fold downs, we could use a red dot sight mm -hmm. or we could use some kind of magnified scope. But it has to be a sight that works for you and your style of shooting and what you actually are asking your gun to do. Right? Definitely. Because if you don't have the proper optic for the application, it doesn't matter how good it is. It, right. It's not going to get the job done the way you need it to. Yeah, and unlike a handgun where we talk about 9 to 15 feet, with, feet defensively with a handgun, it, most of the time you're not even going to be using the sight. You're just going to be extending out and right. whatever's in front of you, 9 to 15 feet, and you're going to hit it typically. Uh, whereas with a rifle, now we're talking about more distance, right? You're getting more distance. You're using that to be able to, to fight off threats at a further distance if need be. When we talk about like zeroing our rifle, even the distance that we zero at, we typically start at 25. Yep. Um, some guys like the 25-300 uh, style of zero where right. you sight it at 25 and then you take it out to 300 and verify and generally the line of sight is going to coincide yep. pretty well. Um, you also have the 50-200 and that works with some loads. It doesn't work with all, with all loads right. and if you zero your gun at 50 with a uh, 55 grain ammo, and then you go out to 200 with 62 grain ammo or something like yeah. that, you're going to notice a noticeable shift in your point of aim, point of impact. So we need to understand those things as well, right? Um, and then we talk about um, the 100 yard zero, which right. a lot of people like the 100 yard zero. I like the 100 yard zero now. Right. Um, some people even go with a 36 meter zero mm. uh, because theoretically, they say that you have uh, the ability to hit a target from 10 yards all the way up to 400 yards, and the hold over or hold under is only going to change by a matter of a few inches. Huh. Um, so there's a lot of different uh, schools of thought out there on how you're going to zero your guns, but the application is going to dictate the ranges that you're shooting. The application is going to dictate the, the optics that are going to be effective for you. Right? So optics and sights are one modification. Trigger. Let's take a step back to the optics and sights. Oh, sure. Um, so for if somebody wanted to put iron sights, mm -hmm. right, as well as an optic mm -hmm. on there, uh, what suggestions will we give them for that? Well, for me, I would say go with a fold-down uh, set of sights most okay. likely, right, just so that you don't have that front sight base kind of in your way, clouding yep. up your field of vision. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, I used to use an ACOG in conjunction with a uh, front sight tower, and you actually can't even see um, the front sight tower in your field of view because of the magnification you actually use. So, so you can put them both on the on the rail, on the top rail. Yep. Uh, and then also, as far as the the mods, where you can actually put stuff on the sides, so you could actually you could actually put different. Oh yeah, you can have backup iron sights, so you can kind of flip your yeah, gun over. Exactly. So you could have a, a optics up here, a red dot, and then you could have a backup iron sights on the side if you needed to as a, as a last resort. A lot of guys are doing that, actually. A lot of guys are running low-power variable optics, too, on mm -hmm. their ARs. So like a 1 to 6 power, or even 1 to 8 now. Yeah. Um, those are typically pretty pricey, specifically, uh, or especially, I should say, for a good one, mm -hmm. um, because anything with an 8 power zoom range yeah. is going to cost you a lot of money, Definitely. especially with quality glass, yeah. right, technology. and illuminated reticles and, and all those high-speed gizmos because... Like technology behind it. Right, yeah. It takes a lot to manufacture something mm -hmm. like that and, and make it a good product. So um, the low-power variables are very popular. They're very good, mm -hmm. um, but just be aware that they are a little bit more expensive. You can also do the angled iron sights, as you alluded to. Yep. You could do um, a co-witness mm -hmm. uh, style of sight. Where you actually have a red dot um, and iron sights that actually can be used in conjunction with each other without ever having a four. Right, and, that, and that's something that I like because then if you do lose the red dot, you don't have to skip a beat. You're right there with the iron you sights. You have the iron straight, sights straight, straight through. through. So it, it keeps you consistent because I'm, you know me, I'm big on consistency. So keeping it consistent, where I'm going to shoot it the same way, except for I, I'm not changing my point of view or anything. It's, it's I'm looking through the iron sights. So technically. I'm still going to be shooting through the iron sights if the red dot battery dies or glass breaks or something like that. Yeah, having some sort of redundancy built into your system is a really good idea, right? And I have a redundancy built into my system as well, and I want to talk about that. So I have this red dot, uh, this is actually a prism scope, similar to a red dot sight, right. Um, unmagnified, right? This particular one, the uh, illumination, this has to go back to uh, Vortex because uh, the illumination on it's not working anymore. I don't know if it was exposed to some kind of moisture, right. if I banged it somewhere doing something crazy, I'm not really sure. So the uh, 
the uh, reticle though is etched into the glass and mm -hmm. so the reticle itself is still there nice. and it's still got a two minute of angle um, crosshair in there with a 32 um, minute of angle circle nice. so I actually have ranging capabilities built right into this scope as well so even though even though this uh, scope doesn't work for its intended purpose right now because it's not illuminating, I can still use it and the adjustments still track because it still fills the role of the traditional scope. Yeah. As well, 62 grain BDC compensated reticle. There you go. So I have my zero set for 100 yep. and I have holdover that I can dial up for up to 700 yards. Very nice. So do I think I can hit a target at 700 yards with iron sights? I've only ever done it once. <laughs> And I'm not, I would never swear that I can do it again. Right. Yeah, Vortex is really good. We actually had a, a, one of our clients that, who had a, a Vortex scope that he I mean, was talking to you about it. He put it on wrong. He mm -hmm. actually uh, screwed down one side and then tightened down the other side instead of coming down. Oh, he crushed his tube, yeah. right? So he crushed the tube, bent the tube. So we actually um, laser, laser sighted it, then we zeroed it out. And it was, yeah, you could literally see the, the laser, the, the reticle just bouncing around. You know, the sight was just all over the place. Yeah. And then I showed him my, my shotgun. I showed my shotgun on it, and it was, it was fine. It was dead on. It wasn't moving at all. So he, uh, he called up Vortex, and they said, oh, we'll run overnight one to you. It's hunting season. I know you need it. Yeah. So, no, they're a great company. They have a really solid warranty. Yep. Um, so that's something to consider, too. A lot of guys say that Vortex, uh, their stuff kind of can break on you sometimes. Yeah. And uh, so that's why they have the good warranty. But with this particular optic, I'm confident just because I know it will still function even though the illumination the isn't there. Right, so I do have some redundancy kind of built into that system, um, and that's that's very intentional. So let's talk about modifications then. What kind of modifications uh, should we be considering, thinking about adding on? What kind of things that could make the, make the gun perform better or make your life more comfortable when you're using a, an AR brand? So all the points of interaction with the gun uh, are subject to modification, right? Like uh, you'll notice here, I have a short throw selector lever on my gun. Um, nice, and, nice and beefy compared to other stuff, right? Yeah, it's it's really. Uh, Here's a traditional one that you got. Yeah, so you can see the mill spec part is okay, yep. right? But this one is much more intuitive for me to use. Uh, it has much less travel, so it's actually faster on and off, mm -hmm. and I, I can that. use it really well ambidextrously. Right. Nice. which is a big deal for me. Yep. A lot of guys like ambidextrous controls. I don't because I've been to classes before where my gun went down and I've got to use the schoolhouse's gun or somebody else's gun. Right. And now I don't have the controls that I want on my gun. Right? Which comes back to consistency. It's, if it's a gun that you've used constantly over and over and over, you got it built in your motor cortex, it's easy for you, it's consistent, it's familiar, where now you're using a gun that you're not familiar with, so it's going to throw you off your game. It could. Yeah. Very, very easily, especially with something as simple as an ambidextrous selector lever. Um, because the guns don't come with ambidextrous selector yeah. levers, so not any gun that you're going to pick up is going to have one. Right, right? definitely. So that's, a, that's one thing that you can do. Um, but I would advise you to stay away from the ambidextrous controls, at least until you're really super comfortable manipulating traditional controls, right? Um, so we talk about the selector lever. The trigger for me is, is such a big deal. Huge. And especially when we're talking about four, five, 600 yard shots, you have to have a clean, consistent break of that trigger. So you have to have a trigger that um, has really smoothly uh, honed surfaces. Now you can't just take your trigger group out and start honing it, right, right. on an AR-15 because it's heat treated, but only on the external edges of the part, only on the very outside surfaces. As soon as you start uh, doing any kind of polishing or anything like that, you are diminishing the integrity of your trigger yep. greatly. Yep. So never do that. If you're going to get a trigger, get either like an Elfman Tactical or I'm actually uh, doing an Elfman on one of our I'm, client guns. Right? right, that's what made me think of it. ALG Defense, if yeah. you like just traditional triggers, ALG Defense makes a um, an enhanced mil-spec trigger mm -hmm. group. It's like $80, and it's all mil-spec parts, but they're just uh, nickel boron coated, mm -hmm. really smooth. ALG is actually a division of Geisley. A lot of people don't realize that yep. ALG and Geisley are the same. Right. So 80 bucks for what's well, essentially a Geisley trigger I mean, that's not a terrible deal. No, and, and you think about it. I mean, when we talk about with the NRA and the the five fundamentals of shooting marksmanship, trigger 
Now that's one. Trigger, 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 trigger control is, is the you know, huge issue. It's site alignment and, and trigger. Those are the two most important things out of the five fundamentals. Yeah, So I agree. So I think, I think trigger is so important on a gun, and if you're going to start modifying your gun, start with, the, start with getting some good sights, then get a good trigger, yep. and then maybe start worrying about some of the other points of interaction on your gun. Now, if you want a high-speed Magpul stock like this here, I get that. I understand it's got a lot of good sling mounting points and all that stuff, but I deem that to be of less importance, right? Or, if, also, you're, or if you're in New York. Right. If you can't <laughs> even have an adjustable yeah, butt stock, right. that's, that's a great point. If you're an average person, mm -hmm. you're not going to have that. So um, you may be limited by where you live as well, unfortunately. Um, I like these pistol grips by Magpul as well. Um, they have a different angle than uh, your mil spec. Slightly. Oh no, this one doesn't. This one actually has a very similar angle. And it's also, it doesn't have the, the finger grooves there, but it also has a uh, spot in the bottom you can store stuff. Right, but it is a thicker, it is a thicker grip, so it fills your hand a little bit better. I like my pistol grips to have less of a steep, steep rake to them. You can see that mine comes in at a little straighter angle. Yep. Than a traditional. Is this now? Did this come with it, or was this is this stippling, or is that? Yeah, I did that stippling myself. Nice. So yeah, this. Um, you need any stippling done? We do it. We do offer stippling, absolutely. Glocks, AR stuff, all that. Um, yeah, so I like to modify my pistol group so that the rake is a little bit less steep mm -hmm. because back here, yeah. kind of hurtful to my wrist all the time. Keep it tight. Keep, keep the arm in tight. Keep it. Yeah, and I'm really big on talking my elbow. I don't do that chicken wing stuff. Right. And uh, I really want to anchor that thing to my body to make sure that I'm stable in yeah. my platform, right? Definitely. So, yeah, the points of interaction are a big deal, and uh, I wouldn't modify my gun. I don't go too crazy with modifying my guns. Right. Uh, and it's Which is good. I mean, you think about it, the more you modify it, the more chances you have of things breaking down, thing, you know, you doing something wrong with it, or being in compliance with the law, stuff like that, especially in New York. You made me think, charging handle, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. I have a mil spec charging handle on this gun. Right. On my other gun, I actually have uh, a one made by a company called Beaten Zone. Okay. And Is that the one you sent me? You said to get for uh, for this no, one? that was a Rise Armament. Uh -huh. um, that's a little less expensive than the, the Beaten Zone one's like fifty bucks. Mm -hmm. The Rise Armament one that I sent you, I think, was on sale for like twenty or twenty five bucks. So pretty good deal. Yeah. Um, I don't put a lot of stock into crazy charging handles. Yeah. Learn to run your gun, people. Yeah, exactly. I don't understand why everybody wants to spend a hundred dollars on a. Side, yeah. and, and if you think about it too, if, if there's an issue with your gun and you have to use somebody else's gun, do you want to have the consistency of using a charging handle that's not standard? Right. right? Exactly. And now you're going to pick up a gun that you're not used to charging it on the left side, and you're, and you're screwing yourself up. So if you if you have the ability to be able to use one part that works across all the types of guns. It's going to make it better for you if the crap hits the fan and you just got to grab a gun and not, you know, I mean, that's why, like, military and law enforcement, they have specific, spe you can't modify your gun. They want them all the exact same, so right. all the guns work together. Everybody's trained the same way, so there's no inconsistency on that training. Right. We're talking about comfort features, little things like that that make it a little bit better, but it's not drastically changing the makeup of the gun. Yeah, I think it's important to learn how to run your equipment the way it is, right? Yeah. So that's why I start with just kind of a base Basics. model gun, yeah. and then uh, I change out the things that I don't really like, and I change out the things that I think are important, yeah. and everything else just kind of stays the same. Because ultimately, if I have to go and use another gun at a, at a course somewhere, or I grab the wrong gun out of my safe and I'm stuck with the one with the mil spec mm -hmm. charging handle, I can still run the right. gun and be effective. It's not un right. un unfamiliar to you. Right. Uh, what, what do you think of slings? What are your thoughts on slings? I think having a quality sling is so important. Two point is my preference. Okay. Um, a lot of people now like um, the, the two point to one point convertible slings. Yep. I think that there's some merit to that design. I don't like a single point sling as a standalone option mm -hmm. unless you're somebody who's like on an entry team or somebody that really needs a specific uh, has a specific reason for it, right. because I think with the, with the two point, let's first of all let's define our terms. So two point, I have a connection point up here in the front. I have a connection point back here in the rear. Now notice that my sling wraps around my buttstock. Yep. Okay. So I got this part here, and the reason for that is because if I have to transition the gun shoulder to shoulder, I'm not going to choke, choke myself out. Right. right? 
because my sling loose enough to, is loose enough to, to get, get to yep. where it needs to go, right? Yep. So I think it's important when you're setting up your sling to understand what what you need the sling for. Right. And it's for weapon retention and control, right? So if I need to let this gun hang, you can. I can just let it hang. Yep. And if it was a one point, it'd be banging me in my knees right yep. now. Yep. I would potentially lose control of it. If you and I ended up in a scuffle over the gun, yep. I'm a lot more likely to lose control of the gun mm -hmm. with a one point versus a two point. And and, the, and just so everybody knows too, the one point would be one point of contact and it would be a, it'd be a loop that you basically have around your neck. So it still keeps it to your body, but like Pat was saying, it'll, it can bounce all around while you're walking and stuff. And it's very uncomfortable. It can be very uncomfortable. Well, in particular, depending on where you attach it, right? Because right. some guys attach it here. Yep. Uh, behind where the castle nut is and the, the end plate yeah, here. These sort of right here. Yep, some people attach them to special hooks on the side like this. Some people attach their one points back here. Uh, and then you gotta have a really, really short sling in order for it not to be dragging on the right. ground and doing crazy stuff. So to me, I just think the two point is the, the most forgiving yeah. across the widest range of applications. Three point um, is where the sling actually connects to itself down the length of the gun. Mm -hmm. I don't particularly agree with having your sling running the full length of your gun for no particular reason. Um, and those slings, they're just so much material. When you, you can get caught up in things. When you try to apply caught. one, like put it on your gun, yeah. it's a pain. Have you ever tried to do that? No, not three point. Uh, yeah, it's, it can be difficult because there's typically a lot of like buckles and different, you know, you got to run it through this yeah. thing. It's like putting on a, a, a fall restraint harness when you're going to climb up a tree stand. It's like, where do I put Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff going on yeah. and it's just like, it's, it's too, too much, much right? Yeah, so I don't like it. Let's talk about another point of, um, uh, point of uh, modification that we forget okay. or I forgot. The muzzle devices, right? Definitely. So on my gun, I have a brake. This is a Yankee Hill machine brake. We were out shooting this gun the other day, yep. and it is soft, man. Yeah. It is flat. It's it's loud. It's a little loud. It's, it's not terribly loud. Um, I'm I'm more comfortable behind the gun than I would be in front of the gun or beside it, like or next to it. Right, right. exactly. Um, yeah, I think for somebody, you know, if somebody's gonna be right next to you on the firing line, yeah. you might just want to give them a heads up. Hey, man, I got a brake on. It might be a little loud. Right. Um, and so you just, got a comp over there. And just so uh, before we touch the the comp, just so people understand the difference between a brake and a, um, a flash flash hider, etc. Uh, why don't we dis dismiss some of that stuff? Because a lot of people think that if you have something that's going to break break that, then it's going to be quieter, or you know, it's a lot of confusion on wh which one's which, what, what works way, what they way, actually do. Exactly. Right. So why don't you talk about that? So a muzzle brake is actually designed to help. Uh, mitigate some of the recoil, right? Yep. Some of the force of recoil. It's breaking that that explosion or that kinetic energy up faster and dissipating it. Yeah, you can kind of think about it. They actually spell it B-R-A-K-E. Um, so you can kind of think about it in either way. Yes, it is kind of breaking up that concussive signature as it's coming out, but it's also a break in that it slows all that stuff down and the recoil forces of the gun. So it actually makes a softer shooting gun mm -hmm. and it's nice. A compensator keeps has it more of a linear idea behind it so it's actually to, to help you keep the recoil in a kind of a straight line yep. uh, so again some recoil reduction is happening there mm -hmm. um, but it's more so just to keep the gun nice and flat on its plane and then an A2 birdcage they kind of tried to that's a flash hider um, that's more to break up the signature of the muzzle flash mm -hmm. at night so that when you're uh, shooting uh, you're not giving away your position to the enemy potentially. The we all need that in self-defense at home, right? Well, true. I mean, it's it's possible. There are muzzle devices out there like those Lantac Dragons that mm -hmm. we've been putting on stuff yep. that um, they shoot out a big fireball. So in a home defense scenario, um, first of all, those things are going to be real loud. Yep. The, the recoil is going to be negligible, which is great, but you're going to go deaf and you're going to have a huge amount of gas coming out of the you're engine. You're not going to have a house left. It's going to burn down. <laughs> you're not, at least your vision is going to be compromised, yeah. right? If you got to shoot that thing in the dark, right. um, that fireball is absolutely going to come. So and that's actually exactly what I was, I was trying to, to uh, allude to or, or go down that trail, if you will, is it, if you're going to try to put something, a break on the end or a compensator on the end or a flash header on the end that's going to, to reduce you know, that, that recoil, then there's a negative on the other side. Right. Well, the sword always cuts both ways, exactly. right? It's you always have to give fire. something up in order to get something. Right. So if you're running a break, there's a good chance your gun's going to be a little bit louder. 
Um, and you just have to accept that if that's what you want because you're looking for recoil mitigation. Um, some, the Lantac brakes, they have a huge fireball. They, they call them dragons for a reason. They call that thing the Lantac dragon for a reason. Um, it's cool. Yep. Um, and they're definitely very soft shooting guns when you put a Lantac dragon on there. I've enjoyed my time using them, but they're not my favorite. Actually, I'm interested to try this Surefire War Comp over here. A three prong compensator on his gun. And this actually is pretty neat because it will accept uh, a Surefire uh, suppressor right over it. So you don't even have to remove your muzzle device to screw onto there. You can like just screw it. Yeah, I think it's pretty neat. And I think that three prong comp is actually supposed to be pretty soft shooting without a lot of excess uh, gas escape and things like that. And once we had the SOT. Yeah, look, you're real quiet around so here. So we, right? we talk about that now. We're talking about um, basically a, some sort of, of noise suppression device. Mm -hmm. And there's some states that kind of require it because it helps with hearing. It helps keep noise pollution down. And there's other states like New York that are totally against it because they think that bad guys are going to put them on their guns, um, silencers on their guns to go out and commit a crime where nobody's going to hear the gun go off. Yeah, well, they actually introduced, uh, there's been some legislation introduced, the Hearing Protection Act, yep. um, and they were trying to legalize suppressors across the board. And yeah. the thought process was because people are going deaf. Yeah. A lot of people do go out and Tinnitus. shoot without, yeah. It's ringing in the ears. It, I, that's, just, that's, what, what? That, that's what makes me go to sleep at night. It's my humming the, hum in the ears. The buzzing, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Sometimes it gets so distracting, though. Yeah. I, have, I have severe tinnitus, and it is a problem in yeah, my life like definitely. sometimes the noise in your own head yeah it, it gets really bothersome so um don't, don't put that on facebook <laughs> not the voice is oh, the noise. Noise. Yeah, yeah, so yeah see different <laughs> oh, it's not yeah we'll edit that part out yeah <laughs> um so at this time i wanted to talk about our sponsors yeah. our sponsors of plugs so we got lee armory so please definitely check out lee armory uh, go to their website look at the guns they have we'll actually be stocking lee armory firearms so that'll be something that that will be an offering to all you listeners out there anybody that wants to purchase any lee armory firearms as well as power tech flashlights power tech flashlights i got mine on me oh, and that thing is a beast yes. so power i love tech. my life Definitely, uh, PowerTech flashlights will also be. Yeah, thank you very much for the like. We'll also be stocking the PowerTech flashlights as well as having them at the gun shows when we do the gun shows. I will be proud to sell those lights. I have really enjoyed mine since I got it. You got your uh, your little uh, uh, put the lanyard on there. Yeah, why? Well, because for me, I just find that it if I drop it, yeah, then at Maybe least it's not you. going anywhere. We got to look the same. I, well, I like it because it's like a dummy cord. Yeah, and they always used to make me dummy cord my stuff. I don't call you a dummy. You don't. I have damage from previous. <laughs> cool. Um, so let's talk about gas system lengths, uh, malfunctions that can come from that, as well as uh, over under pressure. We talked about it a little in the beginning, but let's circle back around to that and, and kind of talk about some of the differences. Some of the differences, you know, what somebody should look for, uh, maybe the pros and cons between them and, and uh, how they'd. You know, decide on which they, what they want. Because we just had a, a customer that bought bought one, right? They yep. they just bought a mid length, and uh, we weren't they really didn't tell us. And then we kind of just uh, pulled it apart to figure out what they want and what they're looking to accomplish. Right. Them. So we didn't sell them a carbine. We sold them a, a mid length. And I was worried that you know they were going to get the wrong gas system length. Um, and the reason why I was concerned about that is because mid length gas system guns, especially on I, for me, I just think that there's no nothing better than a mid-length gas system mm -hmm. because it hits that sweet spot of yep. having reliability mm -hmm. and excellent uh, introduction of gas into the system, right. but it also is just a smoother cycling. Um, it's a lighter recoil impulse. It helps me keep my gun on target. Yep. I'm really not big on leaning into my gun and muscling up on it. Right. So sometimes I, I get, you know, kind of pushed backward a little bit. I don't always, you know, get right. aggressive enough behind the gun. Definitely. And uh, if you're not running your gun real aggressively with a carbine like gas system, that's going to create more of a problem than it would with a mid length system right. that has a little bit lighter recoil, right? So um, understand that carbine length, uh, I'm not knocking it, right? Mm -hmm. um, it definitely still has good applications. The military still uses it. Yep. A lot of police agencies still use it. Um, and it's very reliable. 
but um, I just think that it creates a lot of unnecessary wear and tear on your gun. I think that it's not as forgiving. And if I was looking for somebody to go out and buy their first AR-15, I would say stay, I wouldn't say stay away from the carbine. Like what I would say is air, air toward a mid-length mid -length. system um, because it's going to be a little bit more forgiving for you. It was, it was developed for a reason because they recognized there were some shortcomings with the carbine length gas system. A lot of people, um, for whatever reason, they haven't, hopped on board that train just yet. Um, I hope that more manufacturers do because there are people out there that, uh, like you go to some manufacturer sites and it's like carbine, carbine, carbine. Where is the mid-length gas system? Right. Um, and it's just not as uh, popular as I'd like to see. But it does have advantages. Um, so talking about the failure points, right? Your gas block, your gas tube, Obviously, um, your gas key on your bolt carrier group, yep. that's a big deal. So um, what we're looking for as far as reliability and failure points, we want to make sure we have either um, a, a, a staked, or I'm sorry, a pinned uh, gas block, which as we know are very secure, mm -hmm. yeah. very, very secure. Or we want to have a dimpled uh, gas block area, gas block journal on our barrel. And we want to use knurled headset screws that are going to eat into that metal just a little bit and then back themselves back out, right? Yeah. So that's how we maximize reliability there. We also maximize reliability by matching up our port sizes and understanding that if we have a carbine length system, mm -hmm. we might want a different port size than if we're running a mid-length gas system. And understanding that not all manufacturers uh, work within really tight tolerances. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you're going to get some variance right. in there. Look for uh, people that are making quality components that are consistent so that you know you're matching up your components correctly. And speaking of that too, we want to make sure that we're consistent with ammo. Just like we talk about with handguns, if you're using an am ammunition and you've never tried it in the gun or it's, you know, you're changing ammunition all the time as you're getting whatever this is best on sale today, that may actually work differently with a firearm as well. Yeah. It could be a hard primer, military primers are harder, so you might not you might get a lot of misfire, stuff like that. So using the ammo, trying the ammo in the gun to make sure you stay consistent with that ammo that you're using. And if you change out your ammunition for whatever reason to a different manufacturer or whatever, then you're gonna to wanna to run some ammo through the gun to make sure that's consistent. Because if you're using your handgun to fight to get to your long gun, and you get to your long gun and your long gun doesn't work because the primers are hard and then the firing pin's not hitting the primer hard well, now enough. Now we're right back to right. the handgun so, again. So you gotta make sure that different consistencies with ammunition can also cause issues with your long gun too. 100%, that's a great point. And then the other thing, uh, a lot of companies now are doing melanite coated gas tubes yep. uh, because they think they stay cleaner on the inside mm -hmm. and uh, they're more durable. I think that's a great idea. It's a pretty low cost option. Mm -hmm. And if you're really looking to just max out your reliability of your gun, that could be a really good option for you. Make sure that your gas keys guys on your bulk carrier groups have aggressive staking. Matt, I'm always pushing Sons of Liberty Gunworks yes. uh, products on you. And the reason why, I'm gonna show you the reason why. First of all, these are what we call grade eight fasteners. So you can see uh, they have- And grade eight's the hardening, how hard it is. Right, that's, this, that's the grade of steel. That's a good point for somebody that may not know. So we also have really aggressive staking here. You can see yeah. they have really gotten in there. Yeah, right up on there. Yeah, They've really gotten in there and just dug that material right into right those down screws. there, right on the edge. As you can see, how it's just nailed right down in there, nice and tight. Nice that and thing hard. is not going anywhere. Nope. They they permatex the gas keys onto the bolt carrier group. So this whole assembly here has been oh magnetic particle inspected and high pressure tested both. Nice. Right. So okay. a lot of people say high pressure testing. What they do is they shoot an M197 proof load mm -hmm. through uh, using the bolt carrier group. And it's loaded to ridiculous pressures that you would never see. And what that's supposed to do is ensure that if you get a hot load, a double charge load, something like that, that the bolt carrier isn't going to fail on you. And that's, uh, I'm glad you, you actually set us up with a distributor as a distributor for that one. Yeah, we are a distributor of Sons of Liberty Gunworks parts uh, and rifles. So if you guys need any Sons of Liberty Gunworks stuff, I swear by it. I think it's some of the best out there. Uh, little known fact, Mike Mahowski uh, over there at Sons of Liberty is actually uh, another SDI graduate. Okay. And uh, yeah, so Sonora Desert Institute is where you where I got my firearms tech degree, yes. right? So, so Mike Mahowski is another firearms technology degree uh, recipient from there, and um, he they build great quality guns and they stand by all their stuff. 
So understanding the failure points, right? That gas key um, and our buffer tube, right? Those components of the gas system, they're very important. So <clears throat> all that being said, for somebody who has an AR, what, what, what are our recommendations as far as keeping it clean, keeping it serviceable? We talked about that with, with one client's guns. And yeah, I got somebody's heart gun. Heart with I got a bone to pick with somebody. <laughs> but yeah, so I recommend running your gun kind of wet, right? A lot of guys say that they only like to lube certain points on the gun. Listen, the gun wants to be yeah. lubricated. Otherwise, it's friction. There's a lot of friction. There's a lot friction of metal on metal. wear and heat, you know, heat buildup which is not good for a gun. Well, think about all the metal on metal stuff we have happening here, right? Yep. We have our charging handle sliding inside of our receiver. Yep. So we know we need a thin film of lube on the top of that charging, charging handle yep. and on the sides of the charging handle as well, right? Just to minimize that friction. Definitely. We know that we got our bolt carrier group sliding back and forth inside of our mm -hmm. upper receiver. So we know that we're gonna need some lube there. We also have our bolt that's reciprocating and our bolt cam pin that's reciprocating yeah. within our bolt carrier group. So we're going to want to lube those surfaces as well, keep them from wearing out, right? We also want to make sure that we have a little bit of lubrication inside of our upper receiver just to smooth out the ride for the bolt carrier group. I don't recommend going crazy on the lube inside of your buffer tube. Yeah. You're just going to collect a bunch of gunk right. and dirt. It's you do want sealed, some. It's pretty sealed off as far as... But you don't want it to be dry. You don't want to hear your your Scraping. spring scraping yeah. inside of your tube. If you listen to my gun, it cycles really, really smoothly. Mm -hmm. That's intentional. I, I make sure that my gun is ready to go at a moment's notice because I don't know when I'm going to need it. Hopefully never. Right? Yeah, exactly. And speaking of that, too, we've had in the past, Otis, Otis Technologies has sponsored us and sponsored the company. So uh, definitely if you're looking for any kind of gun cleaning tools, kits, uh, Otis is definitely one of the companies that we'd suggest. They're a New York State woman-owned. I use their Elite cleaning yep. kit for any of your gun cleaning stuff if you send it over here. Um, I'm going to be using an Otis Elite cleaning kit on that. Um, I love their scrapers. I love all their little yep. tools and components and how you can order them individually. The it's a board. great company. Yeah, the yeah the Boar Snake is amazing. Yep. Um, so many good products have come from Otis, so I really like their stuff, we'll the little be, round cleaning kits. Yeah, and we'll be stocking uh, stocking that in the, <coughs> in the gun store as well. Oh, yeah. Great. Awesome. Cool. All right, so closeouts. Any final thoughts we want to talk about AR? Maybe mention uh, we're going to be doing the course coming up in the spring. We've yeah, got April, Larry, right? Uh, April, and then we've got Larry Vickers coming in, too, in August to do uh, his advanced uh, his AR operator course, along with the AK operator course and the marksmanship advanced handgun pistol, yeah. Yeah, advanced pistol course. So, but I'm excited about that because you'll be doing the AR 101. We'll be doing the AR 101 coming up in the spring, and then we'll have Vickers in in August to do the, the AR operator. Yeah, so if you guys couldn't tell, I really like this weapon system a lot, right? Definitely. And uh, I've been using it at least since 2006, mm -hmm. and uh, I've been very, in I became very intimately familiar with it as a unit armor uh, serving in the Army, and I just fell in love with the gun because. Uh, it's so versatile. There's so many great uh, calibers out there available for it, so many great modifications out Definitely. there available for it. And um, you can really do anything that you need to do with this rifle if you understand it, right? So, um, but understanding is the key. So if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, anything you need to know about the gun, or if you want to come take a class from me in April, uh, I, I'm so excited to run that class. I yeah, never I'm get excited. to train anybody on, on rifles yeah. around here because this isn't the right place. Uh, well, we don't think about it as the right place. Because it's the, the laws in the state and stuff and the way that they infringe on our Second Amendment. Shall not be infringed. Exactly. Get it together. Super. All right. That's what we have. Once again, Lee Armory. Please check him out as well as PowerTech flashlights if you need anything. Pat. Good show, man. Good show. Stay safe, shoot straight.